Okay, so today we'll talk about, um, uh, we'll be focusing, I guess, on distributed machine learning. Uh, and to remind you, so we we'll spend the first three lectures talking about, uh, uh, I guess, supervised machine learning. And as I mentioned in the first two lectures, um, and uh, also in the third lecture, uh, the two main kind of resources only do sup fully supervised machine learning. Um, and general supervised machine learning, I guess, uh, the two key resources that we think about when we analyze machine learning algorithms are the computation. Uh, the first one is the computation resource, and the second one is the amount of data, right? So the first key question is, how can we design efficient algorithms that dwell on uh, the observed data? Uh, and uh, here there are a number of algorithms that people have developed throughout the years, for example, Adaboost, that uh, Erlen talked about in the uh, in the review session, and I understood, I understand that also Cynthia talked about earlier today. Uh, that's a classic example of an um, algorithm for fully supervised machine learning, but there are many others like SVM, gradient descent for training neural networks, and so on. So, again, the first key question is how do we design efficient algorithms? But we are over the training set of examples, and here the key resource is computation. Right? We want to minimize the running time of our algorithms. Uh, and a second uh, equally important uh, resource when we do uh, machine learning uh, is the amount of data. And we spent the first two lectures talking about this and about uh, generalization guarantees and confidence bounds uh, that quantify how many training examples we need to see so that we are confident that training um, that classifies it well over the training set of examples also generalize. Right, and we define that formally. And for example, we've seen sample complexity bounds of this font for fully supervised machine learning in the first couple of lectures, right? Where the number of samples to achieve generalization, for example, in the realizable case, will be of the order VC dimension of the concept class times one over epsilon times log one over epsilon. And we've seen that this many examples are sufficient so that we, if we find classifiers from the concept class C that are consistent to the data, then those classifiers with high probability then those classifiers are. Uh, guaranteed to have true error rate at most epsilon. Okay, and this is for fully supervised machine learning, but we've seen that we can even get better bounds. So in the previous lectures, we looked at active learning. So if the algorithm is active and only asks for labels of specific examples, you can even improve uh, uh, the sample complexity here, sometimes in an exponential fashion. Okay, but uh, uh, in all of these uh, kind of uh, um, settings that we've talked about so far, either fully supervised machine learning or active learning, uh, the two key resources in both of them are computation and the amount of data. Now, uh, class, uh, now um, um, so this is kind of more classic machine learning. However, uh, in modern machine learning applications, we often have um, massive amounts of data that could be distributed across uh, multiple locations. So for example, we might have uh, data from large scale scientific experiments or video data or medical data. Uh, this is sometimes is distributed, this data is sometimes distributed across multiple locations. And uh, of course, in order to do learning over the combined data, there is need, a need to communicate, right? The, uh, the data hold, holders have to somehow communicate. And so now suddenly communication becomes uh, another key resource, right? So in addition to the uh, the, in addition to these two uh, resources that we normally think about in machine learning computation and the amount of data, now we also have an, a, a third resource which is communication. Okay, and so uh, in this talk, uh, like in this lecture, I'll tell you uh, a little bit about some kind of learning theory work that is trying uh, to address this aspect. And in particular, uh, I'll mostly talk about um, uh, basically, uh, theoretical frameworks that we developed for uh, understanding and analyzing key resources uh, when we do supervised classification in the classic path and statistical learning theory frameworks that we talked about. Uh, and if I have time, I'll just mention a little bit also about uh, clustering, how we could talk about communication efficient clustering algorithms so that really corresponds to unsupervised learning where the data is not labeled. Okay, actually, I should do slideshow. Sorry, I apologize. Okay, good. I should enter the slideshow mode. Great. So, um, so again, many. So now we'll talk about distributed learning for supervised classification. And to set up the stage, um, I'm just going to again mention that many machine learning problems today involve massive amounts of data that 
is distributed across multiple locations. And often we'd like to learn a lower hypothesis or a lower classifier with respect to the overall data distribution, with respect to the mixture distribution, right? So for example, we might have uh, different hospitals and each of them has a different distribution of patients and uh, we want to learn a classifier, we might want to learn a classifier to somehow identify a common misdiagnosis. Uh, that's one example. Another example could be we might have different research groups, uh, maybe uh, around, scattered around the world, and they all, each of them has collected some amount of scientific data, maybe say genomic sequence data, and we might want to do learning about the union of all these data sets. But of course, we want to do so without too much communication, without having to send all the data to one site. <laughs> Okay, so in such cases, the data is somehow inherently distributed across uh, multiple locations, and each holder only has a piece of the overall kind of data file. And so uh, to learn about the combined data distribution, then of course the data holders have to somehow communicate. Now, communications actually can be quite expensive, so uh, it needs to be uh, kind of considered as an important key resource. And so an interesting question here is, how much communication is needed to learn well? What are kind of fundamental upper and lower bounds in the amount of communication needed to learn well? Uh, so basically, again, as I mentioned, in addition to the typical uh, sample complexity question and computational complexity question, now suddenly we also have to think about communication as a key resource. And in fact, actually, I'm not gonna talk about this today, but when the data belongs to multiple data holders, there are other issues that come into place, like privacy and incentives, right? Uh, privacy when the data is about somebody uh, uh, and incentives when the data belongs to somebody. So there are also some additional uh, kind of um, externalities that also come into place when we analyze machine learning algorithms, uh, when the data belongs to multiple holders. But for today, I'm gonna focus on communication for concreteness. Okay, so this is at a high level. Now, how do we formalize this? Because uh, uh, as we've seen, uh, I am very interested in kind of coming up with uh, Provable guarantees for machine learning uh, algorithms. And so, how do we formalize this? So, um, and by the way, here I'm uh, following the presentation in a call 2012 paper that we have on the topic. Call is a major conference on learning theory. Um, so, um, <coughs> so we now have. Uh, let's assume that we have uh, S entities or S data holders. I'm also going to call them players. And as usual, we're gonna have an instance space, right? Uh, the space uh, of examples. And then each entity I, so now each entity I, so I have an instance space, and then each entity I has a distribution DI um, over the instance space. Uh, and it's the distribution from which our player can sample from. And then I assume that all these samples uh, are labeled by the same common target function, let's call it C star. Right, so we have an instance space, we have S players, each player I has a sound distribution DI, it, get, it can get samples from. And then uh, we assume that all of these samples that all our players get are labeled by the same common target function C star. And then our goal is then to find the hypothesis H that approximates the target function C star, say has no lateral rate with respect uh, 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 to C star, but also over the underlying distribution, and now it's a mixture distribution, right? So I want to approximate um, uh, the target function, I want to find the hypothesis H that approximates the target functions in star, uh, well, with respect to the joint mixture distributions of this local distribution. So let's say uniform mixture, right? So the, the no by D, the uniform mixture of the local distributions, D1, D2, Ds, and I want, what I want to do is to find the hypothesis H that approximates the target functions in star with respect to this joint uh, mixture distribution. And as we've seen in the previous lectures, in order to, to formalize the learning here, we'll uh, follow this kind of path learning, the statistical learning theory framework, where we also fix a class of functions. So this is our uh, inductive bias. Uh, I'm gonna fix a class of function C of this dimension B. Uh, and I'm gonna assume that, um, uh, uh, yeah, this dimension D and I'm just, uh, and of course we also know that the case where the target function belongs to the class of function C, that's called the realizable case. and the case where the target function doesn't belong to C is called the agnostic case. And uh, for the presentation today, I'm gonna think about S, the number of players and how being much smaller than D, right? So D is like, uh, we have high dimensional data, right? So the VC dimension of the underlying uh, class of functions is large. 
they have a large feature space, so the data is n-dimensional. And, um, and again, as I said, clearly in order to achieve the goal of approximating the target function C star with respect to the mixture distribution of the local distribution, uh, the one D2DS, uh, in order to achieve this, uh, then the players must communicate with each other. They, uh, there is no way otherwise. And, um, and how they can communicate? Well, they can send examples, uh, labeled examples, for example. They can send classifiers or hypotheses. They can send some bits, other, uh, and so on, right? And so, and then um, our focus uh, here is to try to design learning techniques that somehow minimize the uh, amount of communication, right? And by communication here, we can mean two different things. Um, the first thing could be the total amount of communication, or uh, that's one aspect you might be interested in, or another aspect you might care about is the number of rounds of communication. Okay, this could, uh, we sometimes call that latency. And of course, in cases where, you know, so we also want, uh, hopefully, algorithms that don't use too many samples in addition to being communication efficient. And in cases where we do have efficient algorithms for the underlying problems in centralized cases, in case we have computational efficient algorithms for the centralized, uh, the corresponding centralized problems, then we also want computationally efficient procedures in these distributed settings as well. Okay, okay so that's the problem set up. And uh, so what I'm gonna tell you a little bit about today is uh, some uh, general, uh, kind of uh, results, uh, some, actually I'm gonna focus really on two things, broadly applicable, uh, uh, I'm gonna discuss uh, about um, a broadly applicable communication efficient distributed boosting implementation. And then I'm also gonna show type of results for interesting cases. So it turns out that you can get some generic procedure for doing a, a kind of uh, a communica communication efficient learning based on uh, a distributed implementation of Adaboost. And then, uh, but it turns out that's already quite good, but it turns out they can do even better in interesting cases in, spe in special cases. And Alan told me that actually Cynthia just talked about Adabu, so that's perfect because it's fresh in your uh, mind. Cool. All right, so now uh, before going and presenting some concrete results, I want to, uh, to just to be, uh, I mean, just to make things even more concrete, I wanted to, sh to, to think about the following uh, special case. So let's imagine for simplicity that we only have two players and that we know, and the players know, and everybody knows, but uh, one of the players, say player one has a positive example and players two has a negative example, right? But then the key point is that we are here interested in learning uh, a single hypothesis H that does uh, well over this mix of the mixture distributions of these two distributions, right? So that's the, the key question here. That's why we need to communicate. We are not interested in uh, finding classifiers as well over the individual distributions, which will be trivial here. We really want to do well on the combined distribution. Yeah, so that's an interesting example to kind of keep in mind. Good. So now, Let's think about, uh, um, right. So now let's think about um, some simple baselines, right? What, what would be kind of simple baselines that we then want to build? And so I claim that there is a, a base on what we've talked about in the first, in the previous lectures. Um, we could have a simple baseline where we can learn uh, in these distributed settings uh, by uh, only using B over epsilon, log on over epsilon examples that are communicated. So we can use just one, one round of communication and only B over epsilon, log over epsilon example sent around communicating. And then we, I claim we, we can output a classifier that has a row at most epsilon. Okay, so this is kind of a, uh, the baseline that we want to beat. So uh, like, what is this baseline? So it's, it's a very simple baseline that we then want to beat. So the idea will be, uh, will be the following. So we have each player, so we have, like, we have S players here, right? And then we have, we have our own data distribution. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna have each player send, we have S players. So we're gonna have each player send one over S times D over epsilon, log on over epsilon examples to player one. Okay, let's assume that player one is uh, the one that will do the computation. So each player sends 
1 over s, where s is the number of players, times d over epsilon of 1 over epsilon examples to player 1. And then player 1 just collects all those examples and finds a hypothesis that is consistent with those examples. And let's assume now that we are in the realizable case. That means the target function truly belongs to the concept space. So we'll be able to find a consistent hypothesis. And then I claim that we can then show that uh, this kind of a hypothesis will have, uh, with high probability of this amount of delta, will have two error rate at most epsilon with respect to the mixture distribution. Right, so that's uh, my claim. Now, uh, why would this be true? So that's basically a baseline claim. So first of all, notice that in total, the, the number of examples that players one gets are d over epsilon times log over epsilon examples. So recall, this is kind of the central complexity bound that we have for the real for the, the realizable case for the, uh, uh, for, and here is d is a VC dimension, right, of my concept class. So this is really the central complexity bound that I have for the realizable case uh, that we talked about in the uh, previous lectures. Um, and so and, and recall that basically if, so player one gets, D over epsilon log over epsilon examples. And now if these examples are truly draw an ID from the mixture distribution, then really just the conclusion that this classifier has to error rate at most epsilon property this minus delta follows just from the classic sample complexity statement for realizable case we talked about several times before. Now, the only trick is that the sample received by the uh, center is not precisely drawn from this mixture distribution. Uh, it's, it's, very, uh, it's drawn from a distribution that is very close to that. So in particular, you know, it contains the same number of points from each di, but it turns out that one can go inside the proof for the sample complexity bound for the realize for the realizable case and show that still, uh, you know, the typical double sample <coughs> argument uh, and the symmetrization trick still goes through, and then we indeed can prove formally that uh, the, the the error rate of the classifier output by player one, which is consistent with this d over epsilon log over epsilon samples that we got from multiplayers. So the output of this uh, consistent algorithm will have true error rate at most epsilon probability of this to minus delta. So basically, it's a simple modification of the classic uh, sample complexity argument for the realizable case to prove this result. Okay, but this is uh, but here the communication is really linear in uh, uh, is is linear in d and one over epsilon. So if this is a is a baseline, it works. You can show it's correct, but you know the amount of communication is quite large. So end up communicating d over epsilon log on over epsilon example, so is quite large. And so when the question is, can we do better than this? I mean, do we need to really communicate so much data, right? Can we somehow learn with much, uh, by using a lot less communication? Okay, and uh, luckily it turns out that the answer is yes. And it turns out that actually we can get an exponential improvement in the amount of communication. So, um, you know, uh, we can reduce the dependence from, uh, on epsilon from being linear in that one of, uh, on our epsilon in being logarithmic in one over epsilon. And, and the cool fact is that we can really do this generically for any concept space uh, that has a finite VC dimension D. So this is a generic procedure. And uh, the actual, uh, uh, and it's, it's really based on a distributed implementation of boosting. And again, uh, luckily, uh, I'm speaking here uh, after Cynthia and after Alan. So you've already seen in Alan's problem session and in Cynthia's lecture earlier today, you've already seen a little bit about boosting. So I only have to tell you enough about boosting to tell you how to modify it for the distributed setting. Because I'm assuming by now you are kind of familiar with the topic. Okay, so what is boosting, as you have seen, is this algorithmic technique um, for turning really a weak learning uh, algorithm into a strong learning algorithm, into a packed learning algorithm that can achieve arbitrarily small error rates. You know, and weak learning just means achieves a little bit better than random on any input distribution. And a specific procedure that uh, uh, for doing so is uh, this popular uh, technique, Adabus, uh, where uh, here the input to the, the input to the um, procedure is just a data set of uh, labeled examples. So I have my typical uh, set of labeled examples. So fully supervised machine learning here, all the examples are labeled, you know, example x1, y1, so unlabeled part, for example, x1, label part for the, uh, my example, and so on. I have example xm, ym, so I have m such labeled examples, a fully supervised data set. And then that's the input to my procedure. And also I have as input a weak learning algorithm. So an algorithm that is somehow able to do top with 
classifies the do better than random by a margin gamma, say, uh, on any input distribution. Okay, and uh, and uh, and then the, that's the input, so a set of labeled examples, and then a weak learning algorithm. So then, uh, and then the output is uh, uh, we want to output a very accurate classifier, right? On the, it's a very small error rate on my set S of examples, as small as I want. Okay, and to do so, uh, this other boost procedure, but uh, what it does at the high level, it proceeds in rounds, and in each round, it constructs a distribution DT over the whole set of examples uh, x1, x2, xm. So it constructs a distribution T over our examples x1, x2, xm. And then it runs our weak learning algorithm A on this distribution DT constructed in this uh, round T, um, uh, uh, basically, and uh, uh, gets a weak classifier HT, which then is used to uh, basically update the distribution <laughs> plus one for the next round. Okay, and uh, again, I see that you've seen this. So initially, uh, D1 is uniform over the samples X1, X2, XM. Uh, and then, um, um, and then um, in round T, we're gonna use the hypothesis HT um, to then reweight the to then reweight kind of the data points and to get a new distribution DT plus one. And how do we do it? Intuitively speaking, we increase the weight on hard examples, which have been previously uh, misclassified by our distribution HT. And then we decrease the weight on the easy examples, examples that have been, have been correctly classified by HT. Okay, so initially the distribution is uniform in the first round, and then in round T, we're gonna use HT to then create a new distribution DT plus one, where we increase the weight on examples uh, that are easy examples, Sorry, we decrease no. We decrease the weight on examples that are easy examples that have been correctly classified by HT, and increase the weight on examples that are hard but have been incorrectly classified by HT. Okay, and the actual formula is written here on the slide. I'm not going to go through it because it's not important for my lecture today. But uh, that's the intuition, and I'm hoping that Ellen and Cynthia already told you kind of what uh, how this uh, are precisely derived. Uh, and in the end, what we do, and in the end, so this is how we construct the sequence of weak learners, of weak, sorry, weak learners over the sequence of distributions, over the sequence of challenge distributions. And in the end, we output uh, uh, the weighted majority vote uh, of these weak learner classifiers. Okay, and then we can show that um, kind of the error rate of this, uh, 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 of this final classifier decreases exponentially with the number of rounds. So if we have, um, uh, kind of uh, uh, like uh, a gamma weak learner that is better than random guessing by margin gamma, we only need one over gamma square log over epsilon rounds to get a classifier that has error at most uh, epsilon. Okay, so this is kind of a quick summary of what uh, kind of uh, Adabus normally does. Uh, and uh, I went quickly through it, but you know, um, the details really, uh, the, the way we construct the distribution dp plus one based on the older distribution DT and the weak learner we found in round THT is specifically written here on the slide. Um, luckily for uh, my discussion today, the details specifically details don't totally matter. What really matters to get the distributed implementation of Adaboost are the following two key points. So, um, so first of all, the key property is that when you look at the update rule uh, of the new distribution, uh, like when you look at how you can start a distribution DT plus one from distribution DT using the weak learner HT. So um, uh, what's important actually here is that um, the, the weight under the new distribution, uh, um, or, or the weight at any moment in time, uh, say at moment T plus one, the weight that we have under distribution DT plus one, for example, XI depends entirely on how, uh, the previous week learners, H1, H2, HT, predicted on uh, XI, on that example XI, and also depends on the normalization factor that can be communicated efficiently. It depends basically on how H1 did on XI, on uh, how the, the week learner H1 did on XI, uh, on my example XI, how H2 did on my example XI, and so on, how HT did on my example XI, and plus, uh, and also depends on ZT, but that's a, just a small thing that can be communicated efficiently. So that's a very, very first key, uh, that's a first key observation that uh, will uh, allow me to implement 
um, basically Adabus in a distributed fashion. Uh, and uh, another key observation is, and by the way, this just follows simply, this observation follows from unrolling kind of this uh, equalities about how dt plus one is constructed from dt using the Wigler learner ht. So directly follows from the update rule. But you know, I'm not gonna uh, uh, unroll it here on the slide, you know, just if you do that unrolling, you can just observe it. The weight that XI has under distribution dt plus one depends on how the, pre the previous week learner h1, h2, ht behaved on the example XI, whether they predict correctly or incorrectly, and also depends additionally on this normalization factor, which is the sum of the weights in, uh, uh, the, we have an example seen round dt plus one, but this is a, just this number that can be communicated efficiently. That's the first key point. And then a second key point is that, uh, to, to obtain weak learners, like how many samples do we need to obtain weak learning? So uh, I claim we only need order of these samples to obtain weak learning, right? So if all I want to do is to get a classifier with a rate, just a constant, but there's not a little bit better than a half, a half minus gamma, I claim I only need order of the examples. So anybody volunteers to tell me why that's the case, given what everything we talked about in the past? So I claim to get weak learning, right? It's sufficient to kind of see order of the examples. So weak learning again is just the error rate of the classifier that output is only just, uh, let's say one, one quarter, like a half minus a half. So it's not, uh, or like anything smaller than a half by a margin gamma. Why this may be the case, it's only order of the examples. Well, because, you know, if I think about my classic sample complexity statements for uh, supervised machine learning, right, uh, that, we, that I had uh, in the previous three lectures, um, I said that we only need to get error of most epsilon with hyperactivity minus delta, I, I need d over epsilon log one over epsilon uh, example. This is for the, I guess, for the realizable case, in the diagnostic case, we know that uh, we need d over epsilon squared examples. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, yeah. And so then epsilon is epsilon for me because epsilon for me is a constant, right? Because I only want to do, to get a constant error rate. So therefore that means epsilon is a constant. So, you know, just follows directly from the classic statements for, uh, classic sample complex statements for fully supervised machine learning. And just by simply observing that, you know, the the error rate, the target error rate I'm looking for is a constant. So I only need order of these samples then. Because the over epsilon squared is a constant then. Okay, so these two key observations. Now I'm ready to uh, describe how we can um, uh, basically, um, so could these two key observations, so the key observations about other booster again, the number one observation is the weights that I have, the, uh, the, the, the weight the distribution dt plus one, uh, at the moment t plus one uh, places on example, on an example, so on example xi, depends entirely on how the previous week learners, h1, h2, ht behaved on xi, and also just on this normalization factor, that is just something that can be communicated efficiently. That's the first key observation. And the second key observation is that to achieve weak learning, we want, we, we basically uh, order of these samples are sufficient. And, uh, and with this, now I can describe to you how we can do a distributed implementation of other boosts that are gonna lead to a good communication complexity. Okay, so basically at, at intuitive at a very high level, we're just gonna have um, uh, kind of, players reweight internally their own uh, set of examples, and then uh, you know just send enough examples to the centers so that we achieve a weak learning in each round, and then everything repeats. Okay, so basically to do so, so we're going in rounds, in each round, each player sends only enough data to player one, so that the player one finds a weak hypothesis, then player one produces a weak hypothesis, and then broadcasts this weak hypothesis to all the other players, and then the players use uh, this, um, you hypothesis HT to separately weight internally their own distributions, and then to send the data for the next round uh, to uh, to play around for everything to repeat. Okay, so let me go through this a little bit more slowly. So uh, and pictorially, so uh, we're going to assume first of all that uh, at the beginning of the process, each player I has a sample S I uh, from its own distribution D I, and then we go in round. And uh, uh, 
so round and around lowercase t, for example, each player uh, sends player one. So the player one will be on, be on that will do the computation. So each player sends player one enough data so that the player one, because uh, this is a weak hypothesis, uh, ht. So for example, if t equals one in the very first round, each player sends d over s examples to the central, uh, to the player one. Okay, so in each round, basically, uh, each player sends enough data to uh, to player one so that player one can produce a weak hypothesis. Then uh, the player one does compute the weak hypothesis, does the computation, gets the weak hypothesis uh, in the round, and then it broadcasts the weak hypothesis to the other players. And now the key point is that each, using this weak hypothesis, each player can reweight its own distribution on its own samples. Right, because uh, remember the performance, uh, it's in the property of the other boost, right? So each player can now reweight its own distribution on its own samples using the hypothesis HT. And then each player can send the sum of its, uh, uh, the sum of its, uh, the weights of its current weights to player one. And then, uh, now, so now each player sends the sum of its weights to the player one. And now when player one uses the, these weights that he collects from uh, each of the other players to determine how, not, how many samples to request from each player from the rest for the next round. So really, you know, uh, in the next round, he needs uh, now needs order of these samples taken from the multinomial given by these local weights. Okay. And so then everything repeats. So then basically, then now player one. So uh, right. So so again, in the final step, player one uses the weights that it received this weight that it receives from the local players to then determine how many samples to request. From each pair for the next round, and in total, he will request, uh, you know, uh, uh, order of these samples. But now the these are uh, drawn from the multinomial given by these weights, by the local weights. And they claim yeah. that if you do so, we essentially do uh, kind of uh, by doing so, we essentially just implement other boost. We faithfully simulate other boost here. Is as if you know one player had all the examples, like player one had all the examples. We really faithfully simulate other boost. But the cool fact. Is that we are able to simulate other boost uh, by only by using very little communication. Okay. We have a question, Nina. Yeah, so, yeah. So yeah, so, what's the question? So this is distributed, but it but one of the players plays a special role and does all this computation, right? So it's not in some sense, you know, fully fully distributed, right? Right. So here that's true. So right, I'm assuming that the total. So the player here does that one of the players does a computation. That's correct. Okay. So but uh yes. So here I'm trying to minimize the number of examples, but you know, I'm not trying to balance the computation. So you are totally correct. Right. There is okay. a, another line of work, and actually I do have another, I'm not gonna talk about it today, but we also have, I mean, there is a line of work where you uh, right here I'm assuming the data is inherently distributed. And I'm trying to do learning over the union of the data sets by using as little communication as possible. Uh, and yeah, and I'm happy if one of the players does all the computation, for example. But you know, there is another line of work also in machine learning where basically you might say I have so much data and I'm gonna distribute it myself, you know, uh, so that, because I cannot do the computation in one location, I'm just gonna go ahead and distribute it myself to, to various players that can do some amount of compute. So that's kind of a different line of work, totally. Great, thank you. Yeah, great observation, absolutely. Um, right, so right, but in this model where uh, essentially, basically, uh, players have, have their own data distributions and we are happy that uh, if we have one player that does most of the compute, um, you know, but uh, then, um, yeah, but again, actually, even even here, our player, you know, doesn't have he does most of the compute, but he's still the computation that you know does are like you know in each round, all he has to do is given order of these samples for these of this dimension, he has to output a weak learner. So it's like the computation that we ask him to do is not like uh, not is not on large amounts of data. Yeah, that's just one thing that I also want to emphasize because we communicate from uh, in each round we send him only order of these samples. So it's very reasonable the amount of computation we are asking him to do. That computation is not this, he has to do all of it. It's not distributed. Okay, great. So uh, so in this, uh, again, so here what we are doing, we are simulating other boost uh, and we are able to simulate it uh, in a way where uh, at the end of the day, we, you know, we are able to learn any concept class C uh, with only log on of epsilon. So we only need log on of epsilon rounds. 
uh, and in each round, you only need to send, roughly speaking, order of B examples, and uh, uh, only log S log D bits per round to, uh, the, yeah, so, so basically the, so we're able to learn up to error epsilon by only using log of epsilon rounds, and the amount of communication in each round is only order of these samples, uh, order of the examples, plus S log D bits per round. And of course, kind of in the end, the final procedure is computational efficient if, if you need computational efficiently learn a weak learner by using order of these samples. And uh, why is this, uh, where is this result coming from? Uh, well, as I mentioned, when I recap other books to achieve error at most uh, uh, epsilon, uh, our, uh, if we have a weak learner that has a, a, a gap, a margin of a random guessing, but is a say gamma, uh, then other boost only needs to go for one over gamma square log of epsilon rounds. Um, so this is just the property of other boost to achieve error of most epsilon round in log of epsilon rounds. And uh, you know the, our procedure, our distributed procedure, a faithful simulation, uh, a distributed faithful simulation of other boost, we almost get get pretty much the same computation as if the data is on location and we did other boost over the, uh, uh, just there. Um, so the current is follows immediately from that. And now the, the amount of communication just follows that in each round, we need to send order of these samples. And then uh, we also need to send S log D bits to kind of uh, for, the, for the weights, we have S plus S log D bits for the weights and also for, to communicate really how, uh, how many examples we need to ask from each player in each round. Okay, and uh, so, yeah, but it's very interesting still because you know here we are able to learn only log on of epsilon. Uh, uh, basically, roughly speaking, if the log on of epsilon is done of communication, while we solve it our baseline, uh, what we kind of do random sampling from each player locally and send it uh, to the center, but baseline that uh, required b over epsilon examples of communication, you already here get an exponential improvement in communication complexity by using this distributed implementation of the other boost. Now, I don't have time to go through this, but I just want to mention that other boost by itself is sensitive to noise. It can end up putting a lot of weight on uh, very noisy examples. And so uh, it is actually, uh, you, you know, it's interesting whether we can get a similar result in the agnostic case. So like this result here is for the realizable case. Can we get a similar result in the agnostic case? And the answer is yes. And one of my students had a paper, uh, I guess we had a paper around my students doing so. It's a little bit non, it's non-trivial here to get equally nice results in the, um, uh, in the in the this uh, agnostic case, just because kind of uh, a lot of the noise noise tolerant boosting procedures don't have this uh, kind of uh, cool property that other boost has that you know the error decreases exponentially the number of rounds. The dependence on one over epsilon is much worse, like one over epsilon squared. So it does not give to get a result for the agnostic case. But it, I guess my student Shang Chen was able to do it. So we can also uh, have a distributed implementation of smooth boosting procedure where you make sure that the weight on any given example doesn't get too high. Okay, so this is for the, uh, this is a very generic procedure. In the remaining minutes, I want to also tell you that uh, this is generic, but you can also hope to do even better than that. And in particular, uh, I'm just gonna give you a couple of very simple examples here. So, uh, and I think some of this relates to some of the exercises that Alan did in this problem session. So for example, if the concept class is intersection closed, then we can do better. And if the, when the, the functions themselves can be compactly described. And in particular, if the concept class is intersection closed, then uh, the class C can be learned in only one round of communication uh, and S hypothesis of total communication, where S is again the number of players. And what is an intersection closed concept class has a property that if two classifiers H1 and H2 or two concepts H1 and H2 belong to the class, the intersection also belongs to the class. Okay, so for example, conjunctions uh, over the Boolean cube or intervals of the real line or rectangles uh, in two dimensions are intersection closed. And uh, here is, uh, so I'm just, just to get the feel of how you can basically use a structure of a specific uh, concept classes to even do even better than generic, uh, uh, than generic distributed boosting implementation. Here's a quick uh, argument for this intersection closed situation. So here, um, uh, the algorithm is as follows. So first of all, each, uh, each player i draws a sample as psi of psi d over epsilon log over epsilon and finds the smallest hypothesis hi that is consistent with si 
with some sample and sense this hypothesis H1, HI to player one. And then what the player one does, it computes the smallest hypothesis H such that contains all of these HIs. Okay, and then I claim that um, uh, basically uh, the hypothesis H to output has a rod most epsilon. Why? Because uh, because if, because of the the, uh, the kind of because um, we are looking at intersection clause concept spaces and because H I um, is the smallest hypothesis H, uh, in C that is consistent to the sample, we are guaranteed that both H I and H will never make mistakes. Both, uh, first of all, none of the H I will make mistakes on negative examples, and H will never make mistakes on negative examples. The consequence. And on positive examples, H, the, uh, the hypothesis output in the second round could only do better than, the, uh, than uh, HI. So therefore, what we are arguing here is that uh, for any I, the error of H under DI is smaller than the error of HI under DI, but those at most epsilon because it drew enough samples in each, uh, locally for each player. And so then that also then implies that the error rate under D of H is at most epsilon. Okay, so that's basically if the uh, if we have intersection clause concept spaces, and each if 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 each of the hypothesis can be the compactly described, then we all can only learn with one, we are able to learn with only one round of communication and uh, uh, by only sending s hypotheses uh, from uh, the other players to player one. So, for example, uh, just to to give a quick example here, so. Um, uh, the simple case, a simple case of uh, so conjunctions over uh, zero one to the d are, uh, you know, an example of a concept class that is intersection closed. So, what is a conjunction? I think we've seen in the first lecture. So, uh, you know, we pick some uh, variables and uh, say two, five, and two, five, nine, and fifteen, as I have on my slide. And then the function f of x is positive, if and only if the example x had variable the second variable, the fifth variable, the ninth variable, and the fifteenth variable sent one. So it's just a conjunction. And so in this case, uh, if we use this kind of uh, argument that I just did here, we're able to learn with, uh, by only sending order of S examples um, and uh, uh, or order of S hypotheses. In this case, hypothesis, uh, it's only described by D bits. We can only send uh, S hypotheses, uh, uh, which in, uh, in the end leads to, so the amount of communication is S times D bits. Uh, so you are able to learn well by only sending around S times D bits. Okay, and what's the learning algorithm? So, well, uh, uh, the learning algorithm is as follows. So each entity locally just intersects its positive example. So basically just uh, just outputs all the variable that are set one in all of its uh, positive examples. And then uh, just sends all of these variables to player one and then player one intersects all of those sets of variables and then he gets the final conjunction. Yeah. And then that's the algorithm basically. So each player basically sends to, to, to player one just uh, the intersection of its positive examples. And then the player, like maybe like in my example here, and these purple ones are the, the intersection of the positive examples for player one. This is for player two and so on. This is for the third player. And then player one intersects all of those and then he gets the final conjunctions. And so clearly we only sent S times D bit. Uh, uh, so, which is good. The generic method, like if we do distributed the distributed boosting implementation, we need to send order of d examples. Now, each example is represented by d bits, so in total we need order of d squared bits in total. So, of course, what we get here is an improvement, kind of in the case where um, s the number of players is much smaller than d. Say, so, say s is two and d is very high. Okay. And turns out that there are some other cool, uh, like, you know, again, depending on the structure of the class, you can learn, uh, you can improve a little bit. Uh, uh, and I just, I'm gonna mention briefly here, because I think it's interesting, I'm just gonna mention briefly one, uh, another kind of, um, it's not necessarily practical, but cute kind of from a learning theory point of view. Another example, so if we're trying to learn parity functions, again, about the Boolean cube, here the, the H function is a XOR function. Uh, and then uh, if we think about it, uh, again, the generic methods need, if you use other boost, we need uh, d examples, that means d squared bits here because each example is represented by d bits. What's interesting actually that follows from some classic communication complexity lower bounds that if we want to do proper learning and to really output a classifier, what means proper learning out, the, the, the function that I learned to also be a parity function, then uh, omega of d squared bits of communication are needed. But uh, it turns out that we can show how we can improperly learn uh, using only order of bits of communication. 
And uh, the key idea here is uh, uh, the following. So, um, uh, so it really, it falls on the fact that we have for parity functions, we have two types of uh, learning guarantees that we can get. So first of all, we can also properly pack learn these parity functions. So just basically what we do, given a data set S of size D over epsilon, we are able to find a parity that is consistent with a set of examples. So a parity H consistent with a set of examples, but just solving a linear system. Okay, but turns out that actually parity functions can also be non-properly pack learn in the so-called reliable useful uh, uh, model. And uh, what is uh, a reliable useful uh, learning model? So here we want an algorithm that either makes a prediction or says, I don't know. So it, it is never wrong when it makes a prediction and it says, I don't know, not most an epsilon fraction of the times. And it turns out uh, that, you know, the way to, to learn this class of parity function in this reliable useful uh, manner, what we have to do is to draw a large enough sample. And if a new point X is in the subspace spanned by S, then we predict uh, accordingly, otherwise we say, I don't know. Okay, and so now the, the key fact is that for this class of parity functions, we have these two types of learning procedures. We can properly pack learn them, and we also have these reliable useful learning procedures. And so here is how we can learn the class of parity function. In general, actually, this argument extends to any class of functions that can be learned in these two ways, both uh, learn, learn them uh, using a consistent learner and learn them using also in a reliable useful model. So uh, the same argument applies in general. So here is how we can learn this even using order of a bit of communication for parity functions. So what we're gonna do, we have player i. So we have right here player i, and we're gonna properly pack learn using the distribution di and get the parity function hi. And also, we're also gonna properly impact, uh, we'll also improperly uh, learn in the reliable learner uh, model to get the rule gi. And what we do we also, so, so player i does both, the, both types of learning procedure, proper path learning gets HI and also does learns in this reliable useful model to learn uh, to get the rule GI. Then he sends HI, the, the, the parity function HI that he learned by learning properly to the other player uh, J and vice versa. And then what's the final rule? Well, uh, player I uses uh, the, will use the following rule. If, if it's a uh, reliable useful learner predicts, then he follows uh, the prediction for the reliable useful learner. Otherwise, just uses um, uh, the, the parity function AJ that he got from the other player. And the key point is that, you know, the high level wise is the correct algorithm is that we get a low error under DJ. Uh, so like player I gets a low error under distribution DJ because, you know, HJ he, uh, has low error under DJ. And since we, uh, since GI never makes a mistake, if you put it on the front in our final prediction rule that it doesn't work. Okay, so then basically uh, that's a quick argument of why this is a correct learning procedure. So we're able to improperly learn parity function by only using order D bits of communication. Now this argument only works when, uh, uh, when the number of players S is two. It's actually an open question to generalize to more players. And again, the argument is general also works for any class of functions that can be learned in these two ways. Uh, pa properly popular and learning the reliable useful model. Okay, so basically to summarize this part of the presentation, so uh, like, you know, once we have distributed learning, you know, communication becomes a, a key resource and you might want to design algorithms that are not only label efficient and uh, computationally efficient, but also uh, uh, that minimize communication. And you can, turns out that interestingly, you can get very generic uh, distributed boosting implementations. Um, um, you know, that lead to exponential improvement over baselines in the amount of communication able to learn. Um, you know, and you can even do better in special cases by exploiting the local structure. Um, yeah. And I guess I only have a couple more minutes left, so I'm not going to have time to just go through the remaining part. I just want to maybe just quickly summarize what we, uh, the questions we're, uh, we're planning to think about there. So, so far, actually, for all of these lectures, we've mostly talked about fully supervised machine, uh, I'm sorry, we talked about supervised machine learning, right? either fully supervised or active learning, where some examples will be unlabeled and we can specific ask for labels uh, of round choice from the pool. We can interactively ask somehow for a specific carefully chosen examples. So, but they still get some supervision, right? But there is, of course, also very, another very important question. How about clustering, you know, when the data is all unlabeled and uh, there, is no, there are no labels and we just want to discover some, we want to, to group the data into meaningful groups. And of course, we, uh, that's a whole topic in its own, you know, um, how to define it, uh, you know, like what's, 
objective function to use a similarity function to use a, a distance function to use it's very interesting uh, you know but uh, a very clean formalization of that which is also very close to theory of computing is to just set an objective function like k-median or k-means right uh, so, and to just try to optimize find the clustering that optimizes this objective so for example in the k-median clustering objective you know we have as input a set of points and we are trying to find uh, a partition of a set of points like in this picture here and center for each part of the partition in order to minimize the sum of all points and the distance to the nearest center. Okay, and um, there are also uh, the K-means objective and so on. So there are, this is objective-based class. And now uh, you can ask the question, can I, now if the data is distributed across multiple locations, can I now uh, learn a, a good clustering over the overall data, right? And can I do so by using as little communication as possible? So that's a question that you can ask. Um, and uh, turns out that, yes, there are some very interesting um, answers. Yeah, you can do it. And uh, again, without going to the details, like for example, in none of my works, what we're able to do is to use the idea of core sets. So what are core sets that are introduced in theory of computing, they are roughly speaking short summaries of the data. So given, a, so what is a core set for a set of points S is just a subset of these points, uh, is, a, is another set of points S tilde with some weight on them so that for any possible set of centers, we have a, the weighted uh, kind of uh, the weighted cost on the set S tilde is a good approximation of the cost uh, of that set of centers on the whole set of points. Okay, so basically, these core sets are roughly speaking short summaries of the kind of uh, of the uh, of the data that uh, that basically approximate the for every possible kind of uh, Voronoi partition for every possible clustering used by Voronoi partition we can uh, approximate the cost. Of that uh, over the course uh, over the data by only using the cost of the cost set. And you know, and th th that's a technique we can then use. So then you can ask the question can I use this idea of course it's then to then do distributed clustering? And of course, you know, very naive. Uh, so I'm going to skip this, but I'm just going to go to the end. So, one, one uh, just to give you the, the punchline. So, once you have these course sets, maybe a very simple solution would be just to have if the data is distributed, is to have each player find its own local core set and send it to the center. And then union of course sets is a core set. And then, you know, the center can just find a good clustering over the, uh, the final union of course sets. Yes, that works, but it's not the best you can get in terms of communication. Then you can do some tricks and some, uh, this is one round of communication. You can do some tricks to maybe multiple rounds of communication and reduce the amount of communication. Okay, and I'm gonna skip all of these. If you're curious, I will have the slides and, uh, you know, you can uh, look at the, uh, uh, the uh, the slides and the corresponding, I guess, papers. Okay, but basically to summarize, uh, kind of, um, um, so, you know, in the, I guess in the age of big data, the data sometimes is distributed across multiple locations. And so the key point of this lecture is that now communication is a very important resource in addition to computation and uh, sample complexity. And you have to think about it when you design your algorithms and you have to analyze it. And today I showed you some very uh, kind of, because uh, I wanted to have clean theoretical results, I showed you some, uh, what we can get in a generic way and we can do uh, like for by using distributed boosting and we also showed even better results for specific concept classes but of course um, you know you, um, I showed clear results here but you know of course the topic itself is um, a broad topic you can ask similar questions for can I do distributed training of deep neural networks and okay what happens you know if some of my uh, you know, some of my uh, nodes fail and what happens if I want to make sure that each node does about the same computation and so on. And so there are many other interesting questions that appear, uh, you know, um, that you can ask in a formal way um, about communication and computation and I guess about the amount of, amount of data once data is distributed across multiple locations. Great, so I guess I'm gonna stop here and I'm happy to take questions if there are any final ones. Okay, um, any, any questions? Uh, no, I, I think so, but thank you so much. Yeah.